Hi, I'm Dr. Gene Preuss. In this lecture, we're going to look at the influence mining had on the American West, and we're going to look primarily at the period of the 1850s through the 1860s. We want in this lecture to identify the importance of mining in Americanizing the West. And what we mean by that is making the West into bringing it into the American sphere. We want to identify the results of this Americanization on the West and evaluate the mythology of mining. A lot of the mythology is that uh, this idea of rugged individualism, that you had somebody out there panning for gold, uh, you know, filing a claim and, and striking it rich. And that, you know, is this idea that somebody was panning for gold, this placer mining, as it's got placer mining, as it's sometimes called. And then it was also very violent out in the Old West because you had people getting rich quick, you had people trying to gain that wealth from everybody else, and a lot of this is, is really Hollywood, and it's romanticized fiction. And the role of minorities in the West and women are often ignored. In 1848, just outside of Sacramento, California, at a place called Sutter's Mill. This was a mill, a logging mill run by a man named Sutter. Uh, one of his employees found gold in the American River. And this set off the California gold rush. Some 300,000 people migrated to California as a result of this. And they're coming along different trails, some along the Oregon Trail, others cutting across going down by the Great Salt Lake on the California Trail, others coming in a more southern route through El Paso. By 1850, more wealth was found in Virginia City, Nevada, and what became known as the Comstock Lode. Now, this was silver, but there was also gold there. The problem with all of this mining is that it's this idea that you had somebody out there with a pan, you know, sifting through uh, debris, in the river, but that only lasted a very short while before that played out. And then you needed different types of mining. You needed hard rock mining. You needed people digging into the ground and trying to find veins of ore. And when that doesn't work, they brought in hydraulics, they brought in dynamite to blast away at the side of mountains and in the holes that they dug. They dug. And then they started needing greater and greater technology. And so you have these new types of ways of getting gold and silver out of the ground and you're going to run into all sorts of problems because sometimes you're releasing other gases and chemicals that have been trapped for a long time and the amount of investment was big. And so the idea that you had these people panning for gold was true for a while but it quickly gave way to more investment, more industry and the rise of industrial mining. It also contributed to the need for railroads in the West. Because of the California gold rush, many investors saw the need to bring railroads out there to get the ore to market. The idea that um, you needed a railroad to help get across the nation was also very important. And by 1862, Congress, after many tries, finally passes a transcontinental bill, this is the Pacific Railroad Act, to help build railroads across the United States. A northern route had long been identified, and this is eventually what's going to happen with the transcontinental railroad. But there was also a desire for a southern route into California. So in 1854, uh, because there were problems in the Mesilla Valley, this is over by El Paso and southern Arizona in that region. The United States had wanted a route there because they needed a pass through the Rocky Mountains. And what they had bought with the Mexican cession after the war between the United States and Mexico, it was still very mountainous. And so this route, the Gadsden Purchase, provided a much more southerly route, and it was also going to be a little bit easier for the railroads to get through there. And so we paid another $15 million for the land. Fishing and whaling was another form of extractive resource uh, acquisition in the West. We talk about mining, but in the years before the Civil War, whale oil was a large amount of the American gross national product. About half of what 
we shipped overseas, about half of what we produced, people always point out, was cotton. But about the other half was oil from whales. And so um, we had been doing whaling in the Atlantic for many years, but in 1848 they discovered these whales over in the Bering Straits uh, by Alaska. And shipping began moving over to the Pacific side as well, whaling off the Southern California coast, uh, as well following those whale routes down. But by 1870s, uh, due to some uh, major disasters on the seas and uh, because of overhunting, whaling in the Pacific pretty much played out. The California Gold Rush was also reproduced in areas like Colorado. And in Colorado, around Pikes Peak area, around Denver, uh, in Little Dry Creek, about 10 years after they found gold on the American River in California, they found gold in Colorado. And this led to the development of several boom towns, Denver City, Boulder City today, Denver and Boulder, Colorado. Gold in Colorado also comes out of this area where people were finding gold. And, um, you know, 150,000 ounces doesn't sound like a lot, but it is a considerable amount of gold. And that just kept increasing. And, of course, that plays out, that mining that uh, an individual prospector could find in rivers didn't last long. And so it soon gave way to more industrialized mining as well. The effect of mining on minorities is often uh, unexplored. People don't think about this. But m the finding of gold and other minerals like silver really attracted a lot of minorities to the West. And so you have about 80,000 people coming into California in 1849 after the gold strike to begin with, and then another 90,000 the next year. And these were also foreign immigrants. So we see some 60,000 Chinese and 8,000 Mexicans coming in to California to take advantage of the gold rush. But very quickly, by 1851, uh, the California legislature has passed foreign mining laws. And these were taxes uh, placed upon predominantly Chinese and Mexican miners, which effectively prevented them from coming out in the field. It was only $20 a year, but $20 was pretty hard to come by. And, and a lot of times, you know, prospectors, the, the idea was to prospect, and so sometimes they didn't find gold. So $20 was a lot of money in those days, and if you're not finding any money, if you're not starting to get rich, it's very cost prohibitive. So this was a way they excluded people who were not American from mining in the West and take advantage of these opportunities. For Native Americans, you already had a policy of removal. And this started in about the 1830s, and this was just a continuation of policies that had been going on, moving Native Americans further and further west. The Indian Removal Act of 1830, this moved them into uh, the Indian Territory, what they called uh, around Oklahoma, into the Dakota areas as well exchanging land in the east for land in the west. But in California, it took on a uh, rather disastrous turn uh, that is going to lead to a very diminished population of Native Americans. A lot of this was due to disease, poverty, and starvation. Uh, as America, more and more Americans came into the west, many Native Americans uh, were susceptible to diseases they brought with them. I mean, this is a continuation of the Columbian Exchange, but also because of the competition for resources. I mean, Native Americans were hunting and fishing uh, for natural resources, but as more and more people began coming in there, taking advantage of those resources, uh, and especially with fishing with uh, better technology, the resources began to dwindle, and a lot of Native Americans are kicked off their lands where they naturally hunted at. They normally hunted at. Uh, they're also, their fish are reduced, and so they don't have a way of feeding themselves. And this is going to exacerbate the problem with disease. More uh, horrendously, even uh, more uh, terribly even, uh, was that the state and local governments were oftentimes paying bounties for Native American scalps. Now, a lot of the mythology of the West talks about Indians scalping whites, and in fact, that did happen, but also the reverse was true as well, and sometimes uh, the re it was Americans or Europeans who paid the bounties for scalps first, and Native Americans were just imitating that. So, there was a intentional 
and government-sponsored elimination of Native Americans that occurred in places like California and other sites in the West. We'll mention some of these as we go along. Uh, one example is the, the Grattan Affair, 1854. Uh, this was when a uh, Lakota Brule, Lakota chief, uh, conquering bear, was trying to negotiate uh, some peace. Mormons were upset. Some Mormon settlers were upset because their uh, a cow was missing. It turned out Native Americans had found this cow. It had wandered off from the herd, uh, and they ate it. Um, and so the Mormons were very upset about this. Uh, Concrete Bear was trying to negotiate and saying, look, you know, we'll pay for it. We'll uh, exchange horses for it. We'll do something for it. But they demanded uh, the perpetrators uh, be brought forward, and when Conquering Bear refused, he was murdered. So this is an example of kind of the overreaction a lot of settlers had toward Native Americans and how little they, uh, they deemed Native American lives. For Mexicans in California, Native Californians, these Californios, uh, the competition was intense. I mentioned the foreign miners' law. Uh, already, and so I'm going to skip over that, but in, 19, in 1849, rather, the State Constitutional Convention, um, Mexicans, Americans living in California were trying to protect their property, and they wanted legislation printed in Spanish, they wanted schools in Spanish, and there was some effort to do this. And in 1851, California did create a, a Board of Land Commissioners to try to negotiate claims and to make sure that uh, native California's claims were respected. This didn't always work out, and a lot of, a lot of uh, Anglo squatters moved in and took lands that were not theirs. And uh, the uh, effort uh, wasn't very effective in protecting native California's rights. You also had other resistance as a result of the wealth and the rapid immigration of people. Uh, you had some violence. You had racism. Uh, one example of this is the story of Joaquin Murrieta. He was a bandit, apparently, and took matters into his own hands to try to protect people. He became kind of mythologized, this legendary bandit, and in fact is the basis for Zorro. So that story continued, and uh, there was a bounty put out for his head, and many heads came in. Of course, not all of them belonging to Joaquin. Uh, and there's some debate as to whether or not he even actually existed or not. But this did lead to a lot of violence against Mexican-Americans uh, and Californios because uh, of uh, Joaquin Murrieta and, and this uh, hunt for him. Of course, this is the days before people had IDs or photographs, and so... Any Californio uh, was suspect as maybe being or in leagues with Murrieta, and so their lives were in danger. There were people who created Spanish-language newspapers, and uh, there were some profits to be made from the gold rush from ranchers who were selling cattle to hungry prospectors. So there was some give and take in this as well. It wasn't all uh, negative interactions. In Texas, likewise, uh, after the revolution, many Mexican-Americans living in Texas, Tejanos, lost political power. One prime example is the mayor of San Antonio, Juan Seguin. Juan Seguin had been uh, active in uh, helping with the Texas Revolution. He had fought. He had been at the Alamo and then later on uh, left to convey messages. And later on you find him with Sam Houston, who always called him son, very fond of Juan Seguin. Uh, and his family, and once again was at San Jacinto, and then uh, ends up as mayor of San Antonio. In 1842, however, he was basically run out of San Antonio uh, after some invasions from Mexico because many white settlers uh, viewed Mexicans with suspicion, including Mayor Seguin. He did return in the 1850s, uh, but he uh, was his family was still suspect. And uh, he did earn, win some political seats and uh, held office, but uh, his name had already, had already been tarnished by many people. The population of Mexicans in Texas, Tejanos in Texas, decreased 
uh, tremendously as a result of people leaving and also because of the Anglo settlement. So they were outnumbered. And in 1845, at the Constitutional Convention, when Texas joined the Union, uh, there was only Jose Antonio Navarro who was present and representing uh, Tejano interests. Like the California Land Claims Commission, Texas had one as well, the Borland Miller Commission. And unlike the California uh, example, the Texas Commission did validate and uphold most Spanish land grants. And that just may have been because uh, Tejanos in South Texas held a little bit more political clout. Another group that uh, we often see romanticized in Westerns uh, are outlaws, orphans, and soiled doves. And soiled doves uh, it, it kind of means prostitution. And so there was prostitution, and there were boom towns, but a lot of this mythology of Western violence uh, is oversold. There were in studies uh, conducted, and they looked at violence that happened in the West and violence in the East in some cities, and found out that there was a lot of similarity, that there really was no more, the West was no more violent than the East was, as a matter of fact. Now, you do have some examples. In 1857, the Mountain Meadow Massacre, where Mormons uh, attacked and killed uh, under the disguise and blamed it on the Native Americans, uh, a group of immigrants coming through Mormon territory. Uh, eventually, the leader of that uh, was executed. And there was prostitution in the West. Many women had no other choice than to serve uh, in, uh, in the sex trade business uh, in order to eke out a living of some sort. Uh, there were a lot of uh, abandoned women. There were women whose husbands uh, had died, and uh, they had very little opportunities. And so prostitution was something that many women turned to, even if only uh, for a short period of time. Another often overlooked aspect was the orphan trains. From 1854, a group of concerned child welfare advocates in New York and in other major cities began trying to do something about orphans. Uh, a lot of children were abandoned or in trouble or their parents had died and uh, they were orphaned. And so some ministers, including one Charles Loring Brace of New York, decided that one of the things to do would be to send these children west, uh, sometimes to work for families, uh, supposedly for wages, but that didn't always work out, sometimes to be adopted by families, and sometimes that didn't always work out, of course. But the Children Aid Society sent children on trains uh, to sites in the west, to families in the west, uh, for up until almost the 1930s. So this went on for a long time, and there were thousands of young children sent west. Also, one of the overlooked aspects oftentimes is the role of women, and there were few immigrant women. A lot of the immigrants, uh, women, uh, f people coming from overseas, were mostly male. However, there were few of there were a few immigrant women, and there was uh, there was an effort to allow women to vote more frequently in the west than in the east because. Um, there were fewer women there, there were fewer men out there, and because of the political power uh, that many uh, politicians in the West wanted because uh, of so few people living out there. And so they took advantage of that and they were able to vote in some states many years before uh, the federal government uh, authorized women to vote national in national elections. And also, uh, one th interesting uh, aspect is that sometimes... Uh, women uh, who were in Mormon, the Mormon church, were often kind of seen as being victims of polygamy and having men having multiple wives. Uh, but in some cases, women were able to leverage that. Uh, for example, there were women uh, feminists uh, and suffragettes who, suffragists who were uh, active and who were Mormon and who defended polygamy. In fact, one is mentioned in the film, uh, Emily Wells. So it did happen, uh, and there were women who, who were uh, able to exert some cause for women's rights out in the West. And so when we look at the West, we see that 
the importance of mining was that it did increase immigration and migration to the West, and that it was a real boost to the American economy, the gold and silver that was found out there. What was the result of the Americanization of the West? Well, it increased ethnic conflict, surely, and competition, and seriously compromised Native Americans and Mexican American population, as well as immigrant Asians who came to the West looking to strike it rich. Uh, they were often faced with discrimination as well. And if we look at kind of wiping out some of the mythology of mining and the West, this idea of rugged individualism and increased violence is exaggerated. Uh, it, it ignores the presence of the federal government, the role the federal government had in uh, protecting against Indians and establishing trails uh, for settlers in protecting those trails. In, uh, it ignores the role of big business of coming in and taking over mining and other uh, opportunities in the West, like land. Uh, many land claims were filed by corporations. And also it ignores the ethnic diversity and the role of women in the West. So those are avenues that need to be explored further, and hopefully you'll do some reading and studies on your own. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time.